sense. Oh, we have begun. So, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome for the second time Pascal Copens uh, today. It's the last day of the European AI Week. We have a 99 event during the whole week, and we have a bonus day tomorrow in the morning that will be on health. But uh, traditionally, uh, we do. We begin with Belgium, then we go to Europe, and at the end we go global. And one of our most important experts uh, for China here in Belgium is Pascal. So Pascal, you are a sinologist and tech entrepreneur. You lived in China for almost 20 years. Um, you experienced first and the transition of the country and the Chinese people from 1988 to till today and you are a partner and speaker at networks and author of china's new normal that you presented last year mm -hmm. but this year you have a new book can we trust china mm -hmm. and that brings surprisingly new perspective on why and how we to trust china so it's really important in this context what we leave today i will leave you the floor to give us insights to talk about your book and maybe make also the relation with artificial intelligence. Sure, uh, thanks a lot, Nathaniel. I will, uh, I will share my screen and talk a little bit about, uh, about what's really happening in China these days mm -hmm. and, and why I believe we should, um, we should look at China from a, a trust perspective. So um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let me just get started. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the question, can we trust China? Uh, I'm going to put more focus on trust than on AI as a superpower, because last year I did a whole presentation on AI and how I believe China is becoming a superpower on AI. Um, but I'm going to talk more about how to put that in context with, with can we trust China? Because as a superpower, this, of course, is becoming a, a big question. And so the question to ask, can we, be, can we trust China, is, is something that, as you said, I, I've, uh, I've, I've written a book about and I've spent 12 months doing nothing else from morning to night to actually try to answer that very, very simple question. But it's not an easy answer. It, it, it got me a whole book and try to explain a different view on, on how China is really progressing and what they're actually aiming for the future. The word trust in Chinese is called Xin, the character you can see here. And it's built out of two parts. It's, it's person and word. And together it means if you believe somebody's words, you should trust them. And so starting to understand trust goes back all the way 2,500 years ago with Confucius, the, the most important uh, philosopher of China, which today most people still follow his morals very much to have their life uh, guided his, his life by, by it. And so one of the things that he said, Confucius, 2,500 years ago, is that it's more shameful to distrust our friends than to be deceived by them. And so this is very deep because it really means that trust in China is linked to friendship. And maybe that's the reason why we distrust China a little bit, but China, they kind of trust themselves. But it's also not just linked about friendships, it's also something related to shame. While for us in the West, it's much more related to, actually, you could say guilt from our uh, religion from the past. Well, in China, it's very different. It's, it's really about losing face and gaining face. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole history of China and explain how trust evolved. And, and so I'm going to start and ask the question, can we trust China to Chinese? And if you ask that question, and I've asked that question to, to many, many Chinese, typically the people in China, what they will answer to you is not yes, they won't say no. What they say is, why not? 
typically they say, why would we not trust or why would you not trust China? Most of the Chinese people I've asked the question to, they don't even understand the question because for them it makes sense that you trust China. Now, why do Chinese believe we can trust China and we don't? Well, it's pretty simple. If you go back in time 30 years ago, well, over 30 years time, China has taken out 754 million people out of extreme poverty. Today, it stands at zero. There's no more people that have actually no food to eat in China. That's less than two US dollars a day. That's what is, is defined as extreme poverty, $68 a month. And so that means that 754 pe million people, that's half of the Chinese population, population, as many as the whole Europe, twice as many as America, actually were lifted out of poverty or extreme poverty. That is eight, more than 80% of the whole world's er uh, eradication of poverty. And so for half of the Chinese, they actually got a better life. And the other half was poor and now is in the middle class. So everybody feels like this has improved. And that is, of course, the reason why they start trusting China. Now, many of these people, hundreds of millions, what they did is they went to the factories in China to build the products that we love so much in the West. I mean, we love these Chinese products because they were cheap and they often work and, and that's great. And so they didn't build this for us. They did it, build it for themselves. They build it for getting a better life for themselves, for their family, their friends, for the people they trust. Now, the question you could ask yourself is why has China become the factory of the world? Because if it's purely about lots of people, millions of people that are very poor, that want to work hard to get a better life, well, then maybe India or Indonesia or maybe Africa or some place in Latin America or South America could have become the factory of the world. No, China became the factory of the world. And there's three main reasons, and they have to do with trust. The first one is their coordination skills, their collective mindset, and the creativity of Chinese. And I'll explain that in a minute. But if you look at the coordination skill, Chinese love to be a master, an expert in one domain. They want to be the best in their domain, the number one. This is from school on, they learn to be the number one. And the reason they do that is because if they are the best, then they get respected. And if they have respect, they get trusted. And so this is the reason that they do this. But once they're the master in their own expertise, they pass it along to the next one that, again, is a master in his own expertise. And in production, this is very, very useful. It's also collective society. What it means is that people that they know, the network they know, the people they trust around them, they want to go into that same direction and they trust the leader to guide them in that direction. This is what we mean by collective society. But the third thing is the creativity of Chinese. And probably many people will say, Pascal, what are you saying now? Chinese being creative, they're, they're copying everything, they're stealing stuff. They, I mean, they learn to memorize at school. I mean, this is not a creative society, but... If you've lived in China, what you see is that give Chinese a problem and they're the best problem solvers around. They love to solve problems. And that is part of their creativity. It's more based on pragmatism. If there's not a problem, they won't spend a lot of time on it. Specifically, when you don't have much, that's what you do. You want to solve problems. And so they're very creative. And so they start trusting themselves in their own capability and pragmatism. And so this has created a whole new environment, a new environment where if we go back 20 years ago, 80% of all the countries in the world were actually doing more business or trade with the US than with China. Today, 20 years later, it's the exact opposite. Today, most of the countries in the world are actually dependent on the factory of China. The result of that after 20 years is that China actually is becoming the biggest economy in the world. And by 2030 about, economists don't always agree what the date will be, China will be the number one economy exceeding the US by 2030. And so this gives them a lot of trust in their own future. And that is central to understand why Chinese trust their own future. Now, what also happened is that hundreds of millions of other people who didn't go to the factories, they went to the cities and built these cities from scratch. Cities like Shenzhen 40 years ago did not exist. It was a fisher village, today 20 million people. Shanghai doubled in population in just 30 years time to 25 million people. And they build the most beautiful skylines that you can imagine. This is really a miracle. It all happened in 20, 30 years time and we can't almost imagine that. But more important than this bricks and mortars is actually what's inside it. China has created over 20 years the biggest consumer market in the world. And today it's not just about consumption. 
It's more and more about looking for a purpose, looking for a mean for the future. They, they want to have meaning to their lives. And so Chinese are going to that next level. That's that level where they're actually looking for trust around society. And this is pretty new because in the beginning, the first 20 years of the past 30, they were really trying to get more and more consumer products because they wanted to get a better life. Now they get meaning for their life. So that's the big change now. Now, what happened is a social upward mobility over the past 30 years that is just incredible. If you just go back 30 years ago, when I went to China the very first time, I mean, the literacy rate was completely different than today. Today, everybody in China pretty much can read and write. And I've learned to read and write. I can tell you it's not easy. So this is just a fact. Every city in China is connected with high-speed train or fast train these days. It's an urbanized environment where 64% of all the people living in the cities today, almost everybody today has basic healthcare insurance and the healthcare is getting really, really good in certain areas, really top notch. If you could just go back to 2019, just before the pandemic, there was 140 million Chinese traveling overseas. And the strange thing about it, that's one out of 10 Chinese that went outside China, they all went back. Why would you go back to an authoritarian dictatorship regime where there's no freedom? So the question is not, is not the question we're asking ourselves. And then what we also see is that 84% of all the, uh, businesses in China are now private businesses. It's not state-owned business. And so the mistake we're often making is thinking that everything goes top down, but actually the real drive of the economy is going bottom up and it's really driven by entrepreneurs and people who want to improve their lives. Now, to put that in context, to give you an understanding, if we look at Belgium, for example, compared with China, over the past 30 years, what we have is that China has exceeded its GDP per capita on average 33 times. In Belgium, it's about 2.3 times. In the last 15 years, it's really stagnated. So you have to imagine what that means for Chinese. If we in Belgium would have had this situation 30 years ago, where we would have an increase of 33 times the GDP per capita, everyone in Belgium, or at least half of the population, would have this car, these cars and on the driveway, a big house, and a few million euros on the bank account. If that would be our reality, we would trust our system, we would trust our government as much as Chinese do. And so this is the answer to why Chinese actually trust their own system. Half of the Chinese, and this is today 230 million families or 600 million people are belonging to the middle class. A middle class meaning a quality of life that they can afford that is similar to the quality of life that we have here in the middle class in Belgium or anywhere in Western Europe. And so you could say China has to, to places. There's half of the Chinese that belong to the middle class, same quality as life as we have. And the other half, actually, they're still very poor, not extreme poor. They have no more extreme poor people, but they're still very poor, a little bit like in Bangladesh or many places in India. So there's two different countries in one. So is China rich or is China poor? And so that makes it very difficult for us to understand China. In 2019, Nathanael explained it, I, I wrote a book which is called China's New Normal. And this was all about how China is setting the standard for innovation. And Xi Jinping in 2015 said by 2030, China will become the leader of global innovation. And I explained in my book specifically targeting AI in eight different industries, how China has already now today almost achieved that leadership specifically when we look at the implementation of AI into society. And a lot just started five years ago, in 2017 to be exact. That's when the government and companies like Baidu and Alibaba really understood the value of AI. And they understood if they wouldn't really put everything onto artificial intelligence, they would never be able to catch up with the West. This was the wake up call for China. And the result of it is that China over just five years time almost became an AI superpower. Give it another five years and we're gonna see miracles. The four things that China is really focused on is actually data, infrastructure, talent, and chips. And there's two of them that they're very good at, better than the West, you could say, and two of them that they're challenging with, but that they're actually trying to catch up as quickly as possible. When it comes to data, I mean, it's very clear. Last year, I gave a presentation explaining all the reasons why Chinese have so much data, uh, but much of it is not just about the amount of data, it's about the contextual 
side of data. Because most of these super apps, that is with Tencent, with WeChat or Alibaba or, or others like TikTok uh, in China, the, the Douyin, all these super apps, what they do is they actually can follow the user journey and they know exactly what people are doing and they can put it in context, which gives the data much more richness than we often have in the West. But then is the infrastructure. And China, of course, from a government point of view, they've invested billions of dollars into AI, specifically into labs, into development, into uh, universities. Everything is really targeted towards helping the industry becoming an AI nation on itself. But the most important is the applications that they put into society. And what you see is that, for example, there's an AI prosecutor in the court where 97% of all the lawsuits today in Shanghai are now going through an AI machine. And that's still a human who has to validate it, but it shows the trust they have in artificial intelligence. Talent has been a big challenge in the past, but China has like 37% of all the STEM graduates of the world coming out of China. And from a young age, AI is now embedded if put into the educational system as well as into universities. And so there's a lot popping up these days and they love AI and they know the reason that Chinese want to become an AI specialist is because they earn more money. Being pragmatic, it makes sense. The place where they're really ch challenged is with chips. And we all know that story. They're trying to catch up. But if you purely look at AI chips and semicon, what you see is that every technology company in China whether it's Tencent, it's Alibaba, it's Xiaomi, it's Baidu, it's, I mean, ByteDance, the TikTok company, all of them are designing their own chips and many of them are starting to manufacture their own chips. This has a lot to do with Trump that actually didn't allow them to buy the chips anymore. So they're really going very fast. Could take another five years, but we can see this happening today. But I think the real power of China becoming an AI superpower has everything to do with the integration of everything. And we in the West, specifically in Europe and, and in the US, we are looking more at pockets. And China is trying to integrate as much as possible. They're trying to be the leader in AI, and they are, in a way, already the leader in data. They have so much data. But then today, what you see is you also need connections. And if you look at 5G, it's very clear that China is ahead of most of the places in the world. Today, there's half a billion 5G accounts alive in China. More than 300 cities in China have full coverage of 5G. It's the most connected place on the planet when it comes to cloud. I mean, there's very little difference between Alibaba, Tencent, and Amazon or Microsoft. I mean, they all have the same capabilities. And then you have to look at the evolution. China's moving more and more towards the edge. IoT is central. This is about Industry 4.0. And knowing that China has all the sensors of the world that they're building, I mean, 90% of all the sensors are built in China. I mean, they just have to implement it. And then on top of that, they want to automate everything. And this is really interesting because if you look at factories, which is, is in, in, important for Industry 4.0, you see today that China has more industrial robots than America, Germany, South Korea, Japan, together. I mean, they're not all operational yet, but they've bought so many robots. So imagine in a few years when they get that all operational. And then there's a the moment of trust, the problem of trust. And the issue with trust in China is that people who don't know each other, people who are not within your network, often don't trust each other as much as we do in, in many countries in the West. And so there's a distrust between strangers in China. That's cultural. And the reason that they feel that this technology can solve these problems is actually because it solves a problem in society. So blockchain is the main driver for the past two years in China. Every company is implementing blockchain. They've built the biggest blockchain service network around just to make sure it works. But then there's also the thing about ethics. And very often we think China, yeah, AI, they're, they're not taking it serious. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit later. China is one of the most serious countries when it comes to AI ethics. But that integration means that everything comes work, work together and there's going to be more trust needed into technology than in people. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at applications, because if you look at applications, what you see is that China is becoming the leader in many of the big industries. You have really great companies in healthcare and fintech and mobility and travel and agriculture that are really global companies and they're all based on AI. That means AI for them is not a nice to have, it's a must have. And I think that's the big difference with many companies in the West. In China, 
they see AI not as a transformation to the next level. They see it as a disruption. If they don't become an AI company, they believe that they won't survive as a company. And that's the mindset of many of these big tech companies. In healthcare, you have uh, E2, you have Ping and Good Doctor, you have iCarbonX. I mean, all in their own range, they're the number one in the world, the best algorithms that you can imagine. I mean, really fighting against the Googles and other companies at the same level. Fintech, of course, everybody knows Ant Group from Alibaba or Ant Financial that didn't do the IPO because of bank regulation. But if they would have, it would have been the biggest IPO ever in history, which is pretty much driven by AI for loans, for assets, and so on. Companies like Didi, the Uber of China, or Ctrip, the Booking.com of China. I mean, it's all about prediction, recommendation. I mean, there's no difference with Amazon and all, any of these companies or Uber. But because they have so many more people and so much more data, they're even more accurate in many times. If you look at agriculture, a company like Ping An, the biggest insurance company in the world, is actually looking, together with Alibaba, they're both doing it, at helping the whole agriculture work with artificial intelligence on a massive scale, specifically with animals and farmers. They want to use face recognition, they are using face recognition, to see if the pigs or the cows are actually healthy and then help the farmers to raise them in a better way. Now, what I find interesting about this transformation, and I could give you a hundred more examples, is that many of the people in these companies that I mentioned that are driving the AI strategy, whether it's from a technology or from a business point of view, are actually women. And this is something that not many people know, but it's people like Jane Sun and Jin Liu from Didi and, and, and Jessica Tang that are really changing the whole atmosphere of how it should happen. Jane, Jane Sun from, from Trip.com or Booking.com in China, the Booking from China, is one of my favorite because she's put there that 50% of all the people in her company have to be women at least. And even in the engineering side, it's like that. And this is really an example that we can learn from. Now, just 10 years ago, 2012, we were convinced in the West that China would need at least 20 years to become innovative. Maybe 50 years or 100 years, if ever they could catch up with the West. Eight years later, those same magazine were talking about suddenly this AI supremacy technology race between China and the US. And so my question is, why did we not see this happening? Did we miss that memo? I mean, come on, this has just happened in five years time. And the problem we have very often in the West, specifically in Europe, is that we have been educated by the French, the Fable de la Fontaine, Le Lièvre et la Tortue, you know the story, where we in Europe, where we in the West are often the turtles. And we are very slow, but we are convinced that as long as we keep the pace and we keep the direction and we do things correctly and we do it together and we have a very big house to carry, that we will always end up first. And the reason we're convinced about that is because every time we look behind us, we see that crazy hare or that rabbit, Chinese rabbit going left and right, going all directions, not the direction we are. We don't understand when they're stopping, when they're jumping and we don't understand what is happening. And so we feel that we will always be first. This is an ontological fallacy. This is really confusing the order of thought with the order of being. And we believe China will always be behind us because we're looking back at where we are. But what we're forgetting is that China doesn't look at us as the end goal. They wanna find their own end goal. And we saw that very clearly during the pandemic in 2020 in the first quarter, where many people in China were doing the craziest things. This rabbit or hare was just jumping all around doing crazy things that only was possible in a real authoritarian regime. And many of these measures they took in January said, this is, this is lunatic. This is something that we would never do in the West. The result is three months later, they were almost at zero COVID. And for two years, they had very little uh, affections compared to what we had. But we wanted to do it different. We wanted to do it at our pace and we wanted to do it correctly. And we didn't look at how China did it as an example because we're not looking back. We're always looking back at their doing it wrong. And so we know now that most of the measures they took, actually we staken them as well later on. And so the result of these two years is that today, the trust that Chinese have, Chinese people, into the government has skyrocketed. It's crazy. And this has a lot to do with the past two years in this pandemic crisis. And this is a graph that you can see from Edel Edelman. It's an American company that does a survey every year about the trust level in business and government. And you see very clearly that most of the Western companies actually went down over the past two years, 
while China went really up. And I've checked this with a lot of my Chinese friends, and they also say, yeah, this is about right. Uh, nine out of 10 people actually believe the system works and the government does, is effective and does a good job. We look at it very differently. Now, when you show this graph to Chinese, and I've done it many times, it's always funny because the response is always like, wow, if that's the case, well, now I get why you in the West don't trust us. If you don't trust yourself, how would we have to expect or could we expect that you would trust us? Now, the question is really what has happened over the past 20 years is that today there's been an enormous progress on AI. China's became a superpower and now they're really looking at purpose. And this is very important because that purpose might not be the same as ours, but we could learn from it and they could learn from ours. But if we ask the question, can we trust China? Not to Chinese, because we know the answer, but to the Westerners, we see the exact opposite. What we see is that the Western view on China has gone really negative. And this was before the war in Ukraine. Today, it's even worse. I mean, a lot of people have started to really distrust China. It's the only thing where Democrats and Republicans really agreed on uh, last, and up to last year. I mean, they were really disagreeing on everything except for China. That's what they saw as a new competitor, a new risk. And so much of this has to do with the narrative that we had since the pandemic, which was blamed on China, by top people in the US, in, in top politicians everywhere. State Secretary or St Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is probably the most vocal in that area. He was the uh, Secretary of State under, under Trump. And he said very clearly in 2020, just after the pandemic broke, he said, from now on, we should distrust and then verify when it comes to China. Let's forget about trust. This was the rhetoric of the Cold War period uh, during the Soviet Union. And then Reagan changed it into trust and verify. And now it's back to distrust and verify. And so people like Mike Popain, there's many of them, has really set the tone. And because of that, everybody started understanding that China, there's something we should worry about. Now, I don't want to blame everything on Mike Pompeo, because in a way, he also has a point. I mean, if you look at China, I mean, many people definitely in the past, there were examples, many of them of stealing, lying, spying. I mean, Chinese were doing unfair business. Think about the European Commission had lots of antitrust issues. It's a superpower. If we look at the South China Sea, what happens in Taiwan, I mean, they are becoming more aggressive and there's a, war, a, a wolf warrior attitude. We have to be cautious about that. Fake products, we all know about that. Don't need to expand on copycats and also being transparative or transparent is not very good. They're not very transparent. They're very secretive. You don't always know behind those closed doors in China and Beijing what they're deciding, how they're deciding it. And ultimately, it's very much a control, control state, meaning Big Brother. I mean, there's half a billion cameras in China, so we have to be careful. We don't want to become that. And then on the other hand, it's a dictatorship. I mean, Xi Jinping in the constitution that was changed. Uh, now, today, he can be president for life. We'll know in November if he wants to take a third term. But he has all the power over the government, over the Communist Party, over the, 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 the police, over the army. I mean, that's a lot of power in just one person. And then, of course, the ideology of communism is coming back again. And then we shouldn't forget about human rights. And all these things are actually facts. There's a lot of things that we should be worried about. And with our Western way of looking at it, I mean, we should not accept any of these things and should maybe distrust China. But the problem is you have to also look at the Chinese lens, not just look at the Western lens. And what I did in my book is actually to put these nine things one next to the other and try to show what the Chinese feel about these same things that we feel about them. And so I invite you to read that if you're interested. I'm just going to take one of them because I don't have time for all nine of them. And if you just look at one of them, which is related to artificial intelligence, because it's about surveying state and, and we're worried very much that algorithms will start uh, helping the government and not helping the people. If you look at that, I mean, China with all its cameras and AI, I mean, it is becoming a control state. In Hong Kong, they're very clear about that. They're fighting for their freedoms, their democracy, because they're worried to be controlled by Beijing. If you think about Xinjiang, I mean, this is really lots of cameras there. Well, we in the West, in our constitution, it's very clear. I mean, we have put the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, freedom of journalists, of, move, of, of movement or mobility. I mean, there's a lot of freedoms that we have put religion and so on that is critical for our future. And we live according to that. 
That's a good thing. We also want to, su to, to support and really to attack anybody that violates human rights. And this is critical to our existence that we want to fight for that. So these are two realities that we look at it. Now, if you look at those same realities, which is really black and white into a Chinese lens, you get a very, very different story. And it's interesting to just have a peek into how Chinese think to see if not if we're right or we're wrong, but how Chinese view themselves. If you look at the last 30, 35 years, most of the freedoms that we had taken as granted were non-existent in China or very limited. Most of the things that we could do just a generation ago was not allowed in China. And so what we forget often is that China over the past 30 years has every year got more and more freedoms that we already had before. And so for them, they feel that the government is actually giving them more freedoms. Now, the absurd thing is that if the trends that you see the last 30 years would continue, which many people say with Xi Jinping, it's not gonna happen, but if it would continue, I mean, in 30 years from now, China would be a lot more free than the West. That would be, of course, hypothetical. The reality is that if you've lived in China, like I've lived in China for 20 years as an entrepreneur, for example, you feel more free very often than in places like Silicon Valley or in Belgium to set up a company, to find opportunities, to find partners and so on. Things go very, very fast and very efficient. So you don't feel that control, although everybody talks about it. And the past two years, it's been very clear that China has been quite more free within their bubble, of course, because the borders were closed than we were in the West. And so it could be an absurd thing to say, but in a way we could consider that with every crisis that hits us, whether it's the pandemic or now the war in Ukraine, or maybe the energy crisis or an ecological crisis or the financial crisis, inflation, everything that hits us, that maybe China is gaining a little bit freedom while we might be losing it. Anyway, the difficult thing is to explain to Chinese why the West is so free. If after 400 years, and now I'm putting a Chinese hat on and Chinese lens, so this is not me talking, this is a Chinese, if you ask, tell to Chinese that after 400 years, African-Americans are still fighting for their freedom. Most Chinese don't get it. And if you then explain to Chinese that we decided during the pandemic that our freedoms, individual freedoms were more important than actually the death we co caused, I mean, Chinese find that this is completely irrational. For them, America has caused 1 million COVID, COVID uh, deaths. And for them, it's just impossible that in individual freedom which actually become at the cost of collective freedom. And so they see this as a violation of human rights. Now, of course, this is a debate that is very polarized and this is not where I wanna go. What I wanna say is that they look at it from a very, very different lens. And so I think we should look at trends rather than at facts. And if you look at trends, what you see is that China and Asia specifically, not just China, is becoming much more the country and the region of opportunity. And they're working much more together than before. While we in the West, we see much more disappointment, specifically during the crises, which actually means that we are maybe becoming less free in our movements as well. So this is how Chinese look. And I just wanted to share this, not to show that they're right or they're wrong, but just to put a different perspective on it. I believe that the journey of freedom, start with Martin Luther King, starts with a dream. And I think maybe, just maybe, that if the future looks like it is today, China might one day become as free or maybe freer than the West, just simply because they have more dreams and realizing more dreams. I hope not or I hope at least we will be as free one as the other. But this is something that Chinese believe in. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Now, the dreams of China are often our nightmares. We often see everything that we talk about of China as images that are stuck on our retina. It's gone in our memory and we're really concerned about it. We are actually seeing images yeah. for many, many years already that gives us shivers. We're really worried about that. And this is telling us something about an authoritarian regime, something that we know from a very strange period or difficult period in time, the Second World War and so on, which we say never, ever again. And so we are fighting for this and we should be doing that. These images have decided how we look at China. Now, the interesting thing is if you show these images to Chinese, they say, well, I can show you 20 images of the West, America and so on, and you will shiver as well. 
Maybe it's that, uh, like that. Now, I don't want to polarize, but what I do find as a conclusion is that actually these images have created labels on China. This is how most of the people in the West are looking at China. We are using very, very loaded words to describe China every single time. And the danger with that is that actually it makes us think of something that may be very different with the reality of China. Now, the other thing is that when we look at all these words, we're often putting other words when we describe our own society. We talk about democracy, we talk about privacy, about freedom, about rule, rule of law, about things that make us feel very good. That's all fine. The problem is that we often put that in context with China. And we say we are a democracy and we want to fight for our democracy because we don't want to become a dictatorship like China. We want to fight for our freedoms because we don't want to become totalitarian like China. And the issue in the past three, four years is that we've added after every sentence like China. And so we've put China in a certain box. And that is really the issue, because if you look at China, they're not doing it in the same way. But the more interesting part of it is if you ask Chinese and you look at Chinese media, and I'm not talking about state media, I'm talking about social media, how they describe their own society and their own people, they're using the exact same words as we are. And so we always look at ourselves as good and the other part as maybe not good. And this is the polarization of society that we should be very worried about. Now, can we trust China? is an answer we've already answered for most of the people in the West, and the answer is often no. The reason that we say no is, of course, because of these images, but it has also to do with the way that how we look at China. We look at China as an authoritarian regime with a dictator, someone on top, that can decide anything, and then it flows through the country, and then everybody has this collective mindset to just behave and follow. And so we see us as individualistic and China as collectivistic. And for me, this is very strange having lived in China myself, because I believe China is as individualistic as we are, and we are as collectivistic as China is. If you look at TikTok, for example, a Chinese company, I mean, it's all, it's one of the main AI companies in the world, and Chinese love to be in front of the camera. They want to show off. They want to be the number one everywhere, just like everywhere. But there's no difference in young Chinese and young Westerners. If you look at rich Chinese, I mean, they're showing their wealth. I mean, they're, if you go to Paris, they're buying everything at Gucci and Cartier and other places. I mean, it's crazy. This is all about me, me, me. China is individualistic and we are collectivistic. If you think about Brussels, I mean, there's a thousand demonstrations every year and we come together in big groups to actually protest for our collective rights. I mean, we do think as a group and we want to protect that group. Now, with everything that happens in Ukraine, I mean, we, solidarity is, is really top. I mean, we really want to feel and help people that are vulnerable. So we are not less collectivist than China. So what is the real difference? Well, in my book, I describe a little bit that the difference has to do with the circles of trust. And if you put these eight circles, which I've described in my book, you see that every circle that you go further, the bigger the circle is, the less influence you have on that circle as an individual. And so what you see is that with the internal circles, which is the network, and then the system circles, which is the green, you have something different between China and us. In China, the network circles, of individuals and people you know, your friends, your family, your school, your, your, your boss, your, your, your colleagues, what they form is actually safety and structure and security. This is very Chinese. This is 2,500 years of family and relationship culture that is very strong and won't go away soon. And so they feel that their internal network is helping them to stay safe. Well, we in the West, we are expecting the system circles the leaders and the nations and, and, and the United Nations and the institutions and everything around us to actually keep us safe and give us structure and make sure that we are secure, something we know very well now these days with the war in Ukraine. So this is very different between China and the West. And if you look at the individual, it's the same. In the individual, we in the West, as people, we want to help other people. Our families, friends want us to help each other to move forward. We're looking for purpose. We're looking for prosperity. We're looking for progress. And we're empowering people, that's what good bosses do, to a better future. And in China, and that's the odd thing, it's the exact opposite. 
In China, most individuals, most people expect the government and the outer circles to help them to improve in life. And so they're expecting the nation, they're expecting Xi Jinping, they're expecting the world, and that's why they export so much, to make them progress in life. This is about looking outward. And so they are looking for progress and prosperity and purpose within the system, which means they have less problem that the system looks into them. And that's where the privacy difference is with us and China. They don't feel this as much as an invasion of privacy because they feel it will help them improve their lives. And so we are as collective and as individualistic as China. The only difference is that we look at it from an inside out versus an outside in. And so we have a very different way of looking at it. Now, the problem with that is that for a long time, We've defined, we started a war on values, a war on values where we believe that our Western values are universal values, which they aren't in reality because values are based on culture. And then we combine that or we reflect that towards the relative or traditional values of other countries, specifically China in this case. And so we believe we are different than China, but actually we're not. It's just the way we look at it that is different. If you think about the universal values, and I've put a number of them on there, this is all about the individual that we need to make sure that we want to treat every and single individual correctly, fairly, freely. Everybody needs privacy, needs justice, the rule of, of law. We need to be responsible for people, diversity. These are the words we all use constantly to protect the individual. This is the system helping the individual. While in China, they have the exact same values. The only difference is that they're looking at it much more from a collective point of view. And so in China, this is much more about telling the individual how to behave towards society rather than protecting the individual. And that's really difficult for us to change that worldview. But this is much more about social responsibility and self-discipline and a community focus. And specifically, if you look at the Confucian values, which are 2,500 years old, you see very clearly that these are all words that Confucius used 2,500 years ago and that Chinese constantly, I mean, Xi Jinping is constantly talking about har harmony and peace and honesty and, and respect and, and stuff like that. These are things that are about the individual who has to behave towards the collective. And unless people do that, they don't feel that people are actually uh, doing the right things and they can't protect the people who aren't doing this. And this makes the difference with China and the West, but we have the same values. The interesting thing is that if you look at those values here, is that within the AI ethics that China has built over the past years, they've put most of these values in there. If you see on the left, what you see is the Chinese ethical principles. And this is about harmony, it's about fairness, about tolerance, about respect, about, I mean, we have almost the same things in there. And for us, we're also talking about fairness, about privacy, about robustness and transparency and stuff like that. But it's the focus that is different, and it's the intention that is different, but we're actually setting up the same AI ethics from a different point of view, inward out or outward in. And so the difference in that is that China is looking at protecting the collective so that they can progress. And we are looking at protecting the individual so we can be safe and actually progress on as, uh, as well. And so this is very different. For China, it's much more an enabler AI. For us, we see it a little bit more as a risk that we should protect. But the reality is we're talking about the same things. And so the laws and the codes are becoming the same. The big difference I would say, if you would really want to polarize it, is that China's looking much more at the right way to do things and to tell people how they should be socially responsible and aim to be fair for all of them. And all means as many people as possible. That also means some people are left out. We, on the other hand, are trying to do good for every one of them. Each one of them has to be fair. And this is where the legal form is much more strong because we have to protect each one of them. Now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying they're almost the same, but this little world or all or each makes all of the difference. And so since five years that China started going into AI and become one of the biggest AI superpowers in the world, we've seen that they've been working extremely on AI ethics because they are very concerned about AI. Because for them, AI is an enabler, but it's also something that will transform society. And so they have to be the government together with NGOs and also academia, industry, 
civil society. I mean, they're doing surveys constantly and asking people, the people of China, Chinese, normal people on the street are doing surveys to figure out what do you care about? And the interesting things is that they come up with things like, yeah, I do not want to be surveyed as much. And I do not want people to have my data. And, and one of the interesting things in China that is now very hot is that within the privacy laws of China, they've added AI algorithms or recommendation algorithms where people have to consent whether algorithms are used against them or used uh, for them. And so this is something that is really advanced because it's based on people's input. And that's not a story we often hear. The result is that in September last year, China came out with the new generation AI ethics code, which is really forward looking. And there is difference between the West, but the difference is really in the details because in general, we see almost the same thing. The interesting thing is that we should probably talk more together because some of the societal and social responsibility and self-discipline that China has put in there it's maybe something we could consider as well. And by the way, much of what is written here is based on what Europe has done already on AI ethics. So they didn't just came up with all these ideas. So they're looking at us, maybe we should look at them as well. But how do we trust China? That's the real question, assuming we want to. Well, one of the things that I've done is I have a YouTube channel and I don't wanna make promotion here, but I have a YouTube channel where every week I put something about um, China on a, a video. I did a few about AI. And just a month ago, I made a video about China's main strengths. And I asked all of my followers, there's about 50 plus thousand followers, uh, what do you think is China's number one strength? And the interesting thing there is that I got a list, and, and you can consider that about 20 to 25 percent of the people on my, on my YouTube channel are Chinese or I've lived in China or worked in China, so they have a link with China directly or indirectly. And the answers were quite interesting. These were answers that really talked about how China sees themselves as, uh, as actually strengths. This is about their culture. It's about the efficiency of, of the government, about work ethic, about the resilience, history, the visionary, the hope, the unity. And I got all these words and I've put them in categories on how many people thought this was the most important. And then I was asking myself the question just a week ago, if I would do the same with Belgium, would I get any of these answers into this list? I don't think so, maybe one or two. But the difference is that we don't see our strengths as the same as China's strengths. But the more important thing is that China sees its strengths actually as something that is a way to, out to actually improve society. And for, for, for mo most of the people, China is really the place where China will evolve very well. And so we have to look at this, at this very clearly because China is using its own strengths for the future. And so this is about a big population that really wants to work hard, a system that they feel is, uh, is uh, very efficient, a culture that is very good, and also a leadership and planning. We all know these things, the skill set, the vocational, the attitude. We know all these things. So I'm not going to go on and on and on about that. But for me, China is the land of hope more and more. And this is something that we have to understand that China is looking at their future very different, oops, at their future very different than we are. Most of the Chinese children today believe that they will have a better life than their parents. And I don't think many people in the West think the same way. And so I believe that we have to look at China in a different light. We have to remain critical about China, but we should not forget about the context because otherwise we're only criticizing and that means we're using half of our brain. China will expect, expect us to really look at treating them as equals because otherwise it's gonna be very difficult for China to do business with the world. And I think this is now the time to understand that China is becoming equals specifically because the life of Chinese and the government and the systems and businesses are becoming extremely sophisticated. And finally, China is becoming, together with Asia, the center of economy, the center of politics, the center of many things. And so we should start accepting that the center of gravity of the world of the future might slowly go towards Asia. I think we should stop looking at China as black and white and look at it more and more as how colorful it is, as how, how I experienced it. And I think we should look at China as a binary environment, not as a binary environment, but more as a qubit or a quantum bit in quantum physics. China is extremely dynamic and 
we see that constantly. It's constantly changing. The only change, the only constant in China is change. And because of that, it is super fast. But it's also extremely diverse. And we look at China too monolithic. And that diversity is their richness. And that creates an enormous, powerful China. Finally, China is very cyclical, which means things sometimes are tough and sometimes are very open. And when it's very open and it's not so controlled, then that's when innovation and creativity and a lot of cool things are happening. And other times, everybody needs to fall in line. And that always comes back to cycle. But finally, I would say China is extremely complex. And so maybe to understand China, we all have to become quantum physicists. But becoming a quantum physicist is not so easy. And probably most of us don't have the time or energy to do that. So if you don't have the time and energy to do that, to understand China, what you can always do is just read one of my two books. And with that, I want to thank you for this presentation. And I'm giving the floor back to Nathanel. Hello. No. So maybe there's some Q&A. OK, I sorry, just but my power <laughs> cable on just a second. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, okay, I had a problem with uh, my computer. So, is there? Yeah, sorry, I had lost power almost. <laughs> yeah, no problem. But I'm looking at the questions. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, what is your recommendation to change our confidence in China, Pascal? It's a question from Anne. What, what is my, what is the, can you repeat it? What would be your recommendation to change the trust we have in China? Uh, so, yeah, well, it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so there's only a few ways that we can do it. Um, and I think it has everything to do with collaboration and cooperation. And um, now it's become more difficult, of course, because of the, the pandemic, but also because many of the people uh, today are, cannot get access to China because China is still closed. Um, but on the other hand, I do believe it's, it's critical to have more collaboration with China to understand not so much how they're different, but how they're evolving. The last years of China is very different from 10 years or five years or 20 years ago. And young people are very different from other generations. Yeah. And so to me, it's really about, yeah, collaboration. Do you think the difference, okay, you are talking about the citizen. Uh, is it the same for the, the, the politics in China? Because uh, it appears or we can feel this is uh, a clear plan that they are executing in fact so maybe the citizen change their perception uh is it the case for for the the political class um well and the, i have another question related to how do we manage the crisis in russia with them um well, what's you sure well that the second question is a very very complex one <laughs> uh, but uh, but just just go back to the the first question when it comes to the political uh, indeed, um, there is some difference, but we should also um, not forget, and I've described that in my book as well, that China, despite the fact that it looks like very rigid, is actually mm -hmm. being constantly changing within the political system. And, and that is, I mean, they're, they're making huge steps, even in AI ethics, if you look at that, if you would have asked somebody four or five years ago, they would probably have said, yeah, China's not gonna do anything. Now they're taking into account what people are saying because they're worried more about chaos and, and things not working because they see it as a national security risk if the country is not managed well. And so for them, it's really about changing constantly. I mean, if you put it in perspective, I mean, the biggest change China ever done was actually to go from communism to capitalism uh, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it, it's completely changed the country. It's just like we would say to the US from now on, because you have social problems, maybe what you should do is now have all the companies turn into state owned enterprises. I mean, that would never happen. But China made that change. So I do believe on a polit political uh, set setting, there's more change that we, than we think. 
talking about um, Ukraine, this is a very, very challenging situation mm -hmm. because um, China is stuck between two decisions that they don't want to take and these two situations that they're in. One is that they really did not expect and do not want to have this war and they think it's terrible what's happening. So that's the same as we are. So China is no different when it comes to their perception of the war than we are. And most of my friends living in Shanghai and Beijing, I mean, Chinese people and foreigners, they, they're much more pro-Ukrainian than pro-Russian. And this is not something you hear in the media. But the reality is that China has also um, an agreement with Russia uh, that they signed before the war, which was linked to the fact that they believe that the demands that and the risks that the, that the West has towards Russia were justified. They don't justify it as a war. I mean, the war, the war is not justified, but what's justified is the fact that uh, Putin and also China uh, felt a threat from NATO and that they felt that this was a big issue. And so this is the big issue that they're actually, mm -hmm. if they now start supporting the West, then it's like they say, everything we said the last five years don't matter. Uh, if they start supporting Russia, they have the whole West against them, which, of course, uh, is a much more bi bigger uh, economic partner than, than, than Russia or Ukraine. So for them, it's clear they want to support the West in, what, in, the, in, in stopping the war, but they don't want to do it in the same way because that would jeopardize their own position of what they've been saying for many years. And so what they're doing is very, very slowly trying to actually do as little as possible so that the West doesn't get angry. That's how I read it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal. There are many, many questions related to the importance of AI in China. For example, mm -hmm. we have a question from Luc Van Gogh. Um, super for being there, but I don't know you have the time to elaborate. It's about yeah, the, the role that... Um, that uh, China or Russia can play. Uh, so referring to the role that Germany has had in the past. So it has been US policy for a long time to keep Russia and Germany apart. Mm -hmm. As together, they would be a formidable competitor. Yep. It seems that the West has now pushed Russia and China together, where China could happily play the role of Germany in that US fear tandem. Yeah. Uh, this no. would mean, OK, so this, <laughs> Okay. No, it's okay, but but I, I don't think China and Russia. Um, uh, I think what China always wanted um, mm -hmm. for a long time was to have a, a security um, environment where both Europe and Asia would be part of it, and and that, in their view, was not something the U.S. wanted. And so this is where the the challenge light lies: is that China. Uh, really wanted to be closer to Russia, to be closer to Europe, to have a, a general security environment for the whole Eurasia. And this, because Putin, of course, started the war, uh, now that is not possible or not as easy anymore. Maybe we'll end up there anyway after the war. Let's hope for it. But for, for China, it's not about taking the role of uh, that Germany has taken uh, in the same way. So I think... The reality is that there's a new world order that has been created for many, many years, but it's not been created by China, but China has been the, mo the engine of that creation. And what that means is that the economic wealth of China has created an economic opportunity of the whole Asian region. And so we're seeing this center of, of Asia becoming more and more important. And that, of course, for the US, that is a real threat. And so Biden very clearly at the beginning of his presidency said, China is the biggest threat and we need to move mm -hmm. pivot to Asia because pay, Asia is our biggest threat for, for the future. Now with the war, he's not focusing on Asia as much because he has other problems to, to deal with in, in Europe. But I don't think China historically and culturally wants to actually control or rule other countries and say to other countries how they should uh, rule themselves. That, that is a long story that I've explained yeah. in my book. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. Uh, so your book, uh, we can have uh, uh, next week in Dutch. Yeah. Yes, from and, uh, Tuesday and on. Yes. From Tuesday on. And in English by the end of April. Maybe. Yeah, in a month from now. Yes, in English. Yeah. And, yeah. That's so great. Um, Thanks. There's everything you want to know about China is in there. <laughs> yeah.
That's so great. Yeah. So uh, I, I thank you very much. Uh, the mm -hmm. next session is about Canada and Quebec. In, in, that is very active uh, in AI, okay. as you know. Um, and then at 6 p.m., uh, we have the um, third AI for Belgium birthday and the closing ceremony with some impressions. So all the speakers, everyone is welcome. And then we will maybe have uh, an appointment uh, in Brussels. I don't know where you want uh, to have a, a beer or drink or what you want. Uh, so thank you so much, Pascal. Uh, and I leave you, um, I leave now um, Casper uh, to give you the, okay, the next. Have you done it? Okay, already. Perfect. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye